So what is a test technique? Well, there are plenty of definitions of the word technique. As I see it, a test technique is a method of designing, running, and interpreting the results of tests. Techniques require skill. You get better with them with practice. In foundations, I distinguish between an approach and a technique. Then I was talking about black box versus glass box testing. But the same distinction is useful for thinking about exploratory versus scripted testing. Some people call exploratory testing a technique, but that's silly. You can use any technique in an exploratory way or in a scripted way. Exploration is an approach. It's a way of thinking about what makes for good testing that underlies all of your tests, not a way of designing and running individual tests. Every technique provides guidance on how to design a test. In lessons learned in software testing, we tried to organize the types of guidance that techniques provide into a few categories, a few underlying ideas. Here are the definitions of seven of these underlying ideas. A typical technique is focused around one or two of these. For example, function testing is defined by its scope. The scope of function testing is one function at a time. Function testing is usually focused around coverage. You make a list of all the program's functions, and then you create tests for each one. It's easy to tell how much of the list you've covered. But there's nothing in this technique that tells you who should run the tests, or how to run the tests, or how to decide whether the program passed or failed the tests, or what kind of bugs you're looking for. Feature integration testing is another example of a scope-defined technique. The scope is a few features instead of one, and the technique says, test a few features together. See the integration. You can do feature integration testing in a coverage-oriented way, but you can also do it in a risk-oriented way. From a coverage perspective, you'll design a collection of feature integration tests that cover most or all of the two-way or three-way combinations of features, and you'll track what features and what combinations you've tested. If your focus is risk-oriented, you'll design a collection of feature integration tests around some potential bugs. The idea is that there are some bugs that you can see by testing a few things together that you can't see with simple function tests. Coverage-oriented and risk-oriented feature integration testing are both feature integration techniques, but the difference in their emphases will lead you to substantially different sets of tests. The next 75 slides describe and categorize test techniques in terms of the seven underlying design ideas. Pay attention to the structure. Pay attention to the test design themes. Think about how you could take your favorite technique and make it more coverage-oriented, or more risk-oriented, or more oriented to a specific type of user. Think about what other techniques you should use to round out your testing if you're relying mainly on that one favorite one. This stream of technique after technique is there to reinforce the structure with examples. No one expects you to learn all the techniques this way. But of course, you can use these slides as a reference for later. The next eight slides are like a table of contents. They give a summary for each of the seven design ideas, starting here with coverage-based testing. The coverage tests differ in scope. Function tests test individual functions. Boundary tests test variables at their boundaries. Logical expression tests test the program's logical expressions. What the techniques have in common is that the tester creates many tests that together reach most or all of the values of this scope such as every function or every boundary. Now these are imperfect categorizations. You can include other techniques as coverage-based or drop some of the ones from this list. The idea of the list is to illustrate a way of thinking about the differences between techniques, not a scientific taxonomy. Tester-based techniques revolve around the person doing the testing. Different types of testers have different types of characteristics. The idea is that it's meaningful and informative to say that all of this kind of testing was done by programmers and all of that kind of testing was done by subject matter experts. Now, I have found it interesting and helpful to work with non-testers who come from different stakeholder communities, but it's also challenging. Just sitting in front of the program and saying, here, test, that doesn't work so well. You have to figure out what activities are going to yield the best information, what questions are going to get to the knowledge they have. They don't know how to do this for you. You have to help them organize their work. But you can't control them too tightly, or they won't explore from what they know. Now, as a supplement to a broader program of testing, this is good stuff. But some organizations take this further. Think about testing by end users, for example. A few users might not be very broadly representative of the many different subgroups of the end user community. And even if your collection of users is very representative, Unless you give them a lot of training and testing and plenty of time to do their work, what are you going to get back from them? How skilled is it going to be? 
I think it is wishful thinking to think that end users who are not testing experts or subject matter experts who are not testing experts will come up with the tests needed to find all or even most of the problems that would end up being significant to end users. Risk-based techniques start from ideas about how the program can fail. Different techniques look for different kinds of bugs. Activity-based techniques focus on how you actually do the testing. The activities. This is pretty miscellaneous group. And most of the tests we classify this way, we also class in some other way. For example, we list long sequence automated testing as both risk-based and activity-based. We see it as risk-based because these tests are especially well-suited to hunting specific kinds of bugs that won't show up in normal testing. We see it as activity-based because every time we think about this kind of testing, we think about activities, about programming and maintenance and developing diagnostics, about the kinds of work required to create and run the tests. If you have a good oracle, especially an oracle that you can use easily in automated tests, then you have a basis for an evaluation-based technique. The difference between the techniques here lies in the differences between the oracles. Imagine having a customer or an auditor or a regulator who requires your company to certify that your product has certain characteristics. To prove the characteristics, you'll have to do some tests. That's what I mean by desired result testing. These are the tests that you do to make it possible to honestly fill out some kind of form or honestly sign your name to a statement of facts about the program. Finally, there are lots of glass box techniques. We aren't studying the glass box techniques in this course. I'm just mentioning them here to put that long list of black box techniques in perspective. It is a long list, but it is only part of the story. The rest of this lecture briefly defines the tests that I've just listed in each category. You might find it just as useful to read the rest of the lecture slides as to watch the rest of today's lecture. Depends on how you learn, but the rest of this lecture won't add much information to what's printed in the slides. We're starting again with coverage-based tests. This slide is just a repeat. It's just a table of contents for the next 17 slides. Each of these slides presents one technique. This one presents function testing, but we've already talked about function testing. And about feature integration testing. And about tours. We haven't talked yet about equivalence class analysis. This is based on the idea that if two tests are very similar, it's probably pointless to run both tests. By the way, equivalence class and equivalence set mean the same thing. Equivalence classes are sets. Boundary testing takes equivalence classes a step further. Two members of an equivalence class might be equivalent in most ways, but there's research that indicates that testing an equivalence class that has boundaries is more likely to expose bugs. The idea of a best representative generalizes the idea of a boundary. Sometimes an equivalence class has no boundaries because you can't order its values from smallest to largest. Sometimes there's a value of special interest in the middle of the class, far from the boundaries. In cases like these, you need to pick powerful non-boundary values to represent the class. Any value that is more likely to trigger a failure than others in its class is a best representative for that class. And because values can differ in many ways, the same equivalence class can have several best representatives. Equivalence class analysis and boundary analysis are traditionally presented as test techniques. They're useful ideas, but they don't really stand alone. They work together in a broader framework called domain testing. We'll study domain testing in Lecture 5. I learned to use test idea catalogs from Brian Merrick. Testers often test the same kinds of things in program after program. If you put your ideas for testing that kind of thing into a list, you can organize your future testing with that list and train other testers with it. A test idea catalog is really a list of ideas about how programs can fail and how to look for those failures. So I usually think of these catalogs as a basis for risk-based testing. But if you measure your testing progress by counting the percentage of test ideas that you've covered in one of these lists, well, that's coverage-based testing. Some types of multivariable testing are designed around coverage testing. For example, all pairs testing. We'll study this in lecture six. When a program chooses to do one thing instead of another, the code underlying that choice is a logical expression. Now, many decisions are complex. They're the product of several choices. Logical expression testing is about testing those choices, especially those combinations of several choices, and about how to decide how many tests is enough.